Welcome to KGXT, Gen X Talks podcast live from Central California. Making plans with the boys. I'm going to hit the town. Yeah, I'm going to make some noise. I'll push past the pain and my wounded pride. All right, so welcome to KGXT Studios. It's KGXT Radio. If you're listening in, we've been gabbering on for a little while. This is the interview. This is not the podcast where my wife kicks the shit out of me for an hour. If that's what you're looking for, it drops every Friday at 12.02 a.m. Los Angeles time, and that's when you should be looking for that. Now, these are the interviews. Some of you love the interviews. Some of you hate the interviews because you like just the podcast, and you don't like the interviews being mixed in. All right, if you don't like it, hit the skip button. Don't beat the shit out of me. You're perfectly capable as a grown adult to skip the interview and move on to something else. You don't need to bother me about it. All right. So we got this going on, and you guys know that we've had about 10 interviews now. They've all gone really well. And uh, and and I, I don't want to say the person's name who's in studio, who has driven all the way up here from Hollywood to join us, but I want, I'll give you the name in a minute. Let me read you a couple things here, and let's see if you can figure out who this is. This is a guy who's been in, in the show business in comedy for a better part of 40 years, I think 36 seven some years uh he was on the fifth season of nbc's last comic standing he holds the he has the record for winning the most bet comedy awards and as he will remind you bet is not a betting app for white people that's he reminds people all the time and he's right to do that because a lot of us are stupid and we get things confused out there been in over 20 films and tv shows um, he's had his own comedy uh, sitcom on BET called The Blackberry Inn, and he currently is the owner of Golden Artist Entertainment, where he guides other people and represents them through through the navigation and mysteries of the world when it comes to comedy and TV and entertainment. So I'm going to tell you his name is Dante. Everybody calls him Dante, but I'm going to take a shot at his last name here, which he has warned me not to do. So if I fuck it up, he may get up and walk out of the studio right now. But I'm going to call him Dantro, Dante... Ru- oh, fuck that. I fucked the first name on that. Dante Ruscielli. How close was that? Perfect. Perfection. Is that okay? Perfect. So Dante is here with us. He's in studio. He made the drive. We've settled Hi, in. Hi, guys. You got to tell me how this all started, and I, I want to start back with where were you born and raised? Okay, I was born in China Lake slash Ridgecrest. If you're from California, <laughs> you know that that's near the butthole of America. <laughs> I would say the roof. Yeah, yeah. It's, a, it's at the top, too, though. Yeah, man. It's and, crazy there. And how? Wh- wh- what year were you born then? 1970 in, in Ridgecrest Hospital, but we were on the base. Um, my father oh, was- Oh, you're in the military base. My, yeah, my dad was uh, Air Force, but we were on a Navy base. He was a civil servant. Yeah. And so- I grew up there, man. That was fishing on the weekends, if if we could, or just Boy, chasing lizards gotta, during the week. I got to tell you, that's an isolated place to start your life. It is. It's, it's a crazy know, it's, place it's, to live. It's not the hub of anywhere, really. No, it's it, far from everywhere. It's government secrets. If you want to be the hub of that something, is true. <laughs> that's true. Yeah, like the and so weird things were invented there. Like the Sidewinder missile was there, and all these other things. But urinal cakes, you know, those things we piss on. <laughs> urinal cakes, um, glow sticks. The thing. Well, that that I guess is more military, sure. But glow sticks, um, a million now, things. You see, but, if they would have put those two together, we could have pissed in the dark. <laughs> no one ever thought of that. You see, this is right. why. This is why you need to run this shit by me before oh, you guys man, market that was smart. things. <laughs> that was smart when you piss on it it lights it's, up there the you room. go it just now you can see what you're doing yeah, so where did you so how did you if you were up in ridgecrest you're at yeah. the top of the world you're two hours from everywhere yeah how did you how did you start in comedy where was where did you get that feeling okay so my father was in charge of visitors so if you know nixon came to town or kennedy or whoever it was oh. my dad was in charge of that visit if it was uso so I got to go see these people and one time, so I'd always wanted to be a comic and right. one time this uh, improv troupe came through and I turned to my little buddy next to me and I said, hey, why don't we do 
stand up together and in you know kind of what they just did but write different jokes and he said yeah and we did it and so we did it at our school we did it in my backyard and then we realized our careers were over that was as far <laughs> as we could get in ridgecrest and <laughs> so so you um, maxed out the audience in ridgecrest pretty yes, quick <laughs> right away right away we had done the school circuit so I moved to San Diego with my parents when I was 12, and by 15, I was inside the comedy store doing stand-up, but had to run out because I was underage. Yeah. So you had to run in, do your show, and then run back before out. Before anybody complained. Yeah, before anybody yeah. called, made a phone call. Yes. You know, that that has to be... Now, I'm guessing. I've been to both places, but at, at that age... That's got to be culture shock. It was a, the biggest shock to me in the world was like we used to come to Bakersfield, which a lot of people would consider a smaller town. Yeah. We used to come here as the big city. So we would come here at Christmas wow. to do all of our shopping. I yeah. was told, uh, you know, certain things sad for me about Santa in a mall <laughs> right here. <laughs> I'll never forget well, Bakersfield for at that. At least you weren't told Santa can't find Ridgecrest. Sorry. He's right. Far, right. He always far. found Ridgecrest, thank God. But no. So, yeah, man, it was um, it was isolating and weird. And um, So yeah. where, where exactly, how old were you? Where exactly was your first stand-up gig? Your first time that you, not, not even, it doesn't have to be paid. The first time you got in front of a microphone in front of a real audience. Okay. That would be at the Comedy Store in La Jolla. Actually, no, I'm lying. That would be at the Improv in Hollywood. Me and all my friends from high school drove up and... Um, yeah, for some reason at the improv there, I could we could all stand and we could all go in. We could all go in. I think yeah. it's eighteen and up or something, or maybe even less, because um, they serve food. But yeah, it was crazy. Um, I there was a guy named Jimmy Brogan who was the host, and I remembered him from a sitcom that was a spinoff of Happy Days that yeah. no one remembers called well, Out of the Blue. I don't remember that. Yeah, he yeah. played an angel on Happy Days, and then um, they gave him his own angel show. Did he have a? Was it a pilot, or did he actually have a? a we watched one season. I watched one so season. So made it as one a season. Kid. Yeah, made right. it one season. They took it off, and then he ended up. The, uh, interesting story: being the booker for the Tonight Show up until uh, Jay left. He wow. Was, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he, he was, plugged in right there and kept yeah. going. So, so he was my host that night. We go up. I don't remember anything except the lights are bright. And uh, a guy on crutches being at the show. Well, cut to a year later, the guy on crutches is the manager at the comedy store uh, down in La Jolla or wherever I was growing up in San Diego. And uh, he let me be a doorman and stuff. I had a fake ID. Do you know who Faison Love is? No. He's kind of the bigger black guy in uh, Elf. He was in um, Friday. Oh, yeah, yeah. I you know, know who I mean. He's in a bunch of movies. Yeah, he's in a bunch of movies. Sure. We went to high school together. And so he always looked like he was 50 since, <laughs> since we were like teenagers. So he had no problem. They didn't even check his ID. Yeah. You know, he was probably. So when I was there at 15, I walk in and he's there. He's probably because he's a couple years old. He was probably like 17, but should. Be, it's 21 and Shouldn't up. Shouldn't be there. But they didn't card him. So he says, hey, man, don't fuck this up for me. Just <laughs> just don't, you know, say we went to school together, blah, blah, blah. I'm going to tell him you're 19. That way you have two years to run in and out. Yeah. So he helped me out. So you don't, when you said the first time you were on stage, all you remember is the bright lights and the guy in crutches. You can't tell me how you did. Nope. Couldn't <laughs> tell you. I'm, I'm sure we were maybe terrible. I can tell you our first joke. Um, I did a, I, I, oh yeah, people are watching. So I guess I can do it here. It yeah. was uh, a, uh, uh, God. I mean, it was a hitchhiker. Was, was it an impersonation? Because you do a lot of those. Yeah, it was a. It was an impression of a hitchhiker in the rain. Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. <laughs> right. All right. Now it's and back then Polish <laughs> jokes were a big deal. I guess it was like Polish people were supposed to be dumb in the eighties. So yeah. that's you just told Polish jokes. So and then it was Polish hitchhiker in the rain. So if you're watching, <laughs> keep, I'm putting my hand over my thumb <laughs> as to block the rain. <laughs> anyway, that was for your listeners. By you the way, I was that, closed captioning. The the best part of that is, yeah. is that. Uh, <laughs> Is it you had to explain it? <laughs> yes, yes. So that was the first joke we ever wrote. I had to explain because I didn't know how many people listen with right. Yeah, it doesn't yeah. Trans, doesn't translate to audio as much. But there's Correct. there's a video portion of this. It'll yes, show up. Yes, so. yes, yes. Have you ever have you ever really bombed bad? Have oh you, yeah, all the time. How, how, what's the, what's the one that sticks out that you wish you could redo? <laughs> I my first time playing at a black club. Faison introduced me to it in San Diego. It was near yeah. my parents' house, and a football player from the Chargers owned it. 
And uh, he goes, you should go play Smokey Gaines nightclub. And I went, all right. So I go down there. Man, I said everything wrong. I, I probably said, you people. I said, who's your greatest hero? And oh, uh, my God. Uh, uh, like thinking of, you know, Martin Luther King. And people are like yelling Oprah at me and stuff. <laughs> it was horrible. And so Faison said to me afterwards, he, he hit me in the knee. He goes, that's okay. Just watch shows here for about a month. You'll figure it out. So in, in contrast to that, yeah. you in anyone's career with anything they're doing not just comedy but you know movies and tv or even you have moments where you nail it tell me one time when you just think it went it went right every every there was no fat on any joke they all landed what do you what what do you remember about that that was me uh at the semifinals for last comic standing yeah i remember them i asked the guy right before i went up has anyone ever gotten a standing ovation at the semifinals no all right i'll be right back with one that's what i told him wow and i just said to myself it's time go do your best turn it on turn it on yeah. this is national television they are not going to show they're they're going to show everything wrong that i do they are they're not they, they, they like doing that that's part of the drama yeah i had a friend go on there and he bombed and he was a national headliner and i'm sure it killed his career for at least a year wow yeah because he kind of bombed on there but they but, choose for what they do for the ratings there's nothing you can do about it but you nailed it i nailed it i nailed it so hard that you know i got that standing ovation and you know i God, can you can you feel any better when you're in front of that many people and you and you, you land on both feet and you're right. just like i got it yeah, it's a, it's a crazy thing. You know what it really honestly is? It's confidence. Because I teach a class about comedy and I tell people, if you want to win a comedy contest, it's confidence. See yourself do it. See it over and over. See the movie of yourself right. being a winner and winning and, and how you're going to do. Like, see yourself doing that set a hundred times until it's perfect. And then go do that. Yeah, and, but if you can, when you pull it off, man, what a feeling that must be yeah. you're standing there hitting that. How do you? How bad has it ever been with hecklers? Because I watched a lot of your stuff, did a little homework, catching up on you, and you know, you, I never really found anything online where I could see that you, you had to deal with a heckler that was giving you issues. You do a ton of fan interaction, yep. which I love that kind of comedy. I love the comedy where the, where the comic can get up there and he can work the room. He can pick apart the room. He can work the room. He interacts with people right off the bat and gets everybody involved. And then, then you do your routine. But heckling's different. Yep. How did, how has that ever gotten to you? Have you ever, have you ever had one fumble you up and mess you up or do you turn those things around? I never have a, heck, a, a heckler bother me because I'm the ship's captain when I'm up there. That's how I see it. Yeah. If I've done something for 37 years and someone can say a few words and take me down, I should probably get a new job. <laughs> right? Yeah. I mean, I get it. Yeah. yeah well, so hey, even if you're the captain of the Titanic, there's still icebergs. <laughs> there are. There are. Yeah. You just so gotta not the hit them. The truth is. We're all people. No one wants to have a bad night. If someone's having a bad night, the, the best thing to do isn't to be like, you're a shit person, you know? Yeah. It's usually to be like, what? What's happening over there? No, that's not the truth. No one pick on them. Just be quiet, you know? Yeah. Well, you could, like you said, you're the captain. You can turn the rest of a room on somebody right. pretty quick if you want to. I know to. that I can, right. I, I have the, it's called mercy, and yeah. I'm not doing it. Right, I, I would agree with that. Yeah. So, But you have run into hecklers before, just nothing you couldn't handle, because there's been times I've watched comics, and they get heckled. I've seen them flop. I've seen them walk off stage. I've also seen them own the moment and bring those hecklers back around. You know, where they're part of the crowd, okay, they calm them down and things go smooth. It can't be an easy thing because you never know. Well, here's part of the problem. I have giant scars on my face. I'm not a small man. You know what I mean? Like, you, like someone yelled something at me as I was crossing the crosswalk. Something shitty. <laughs> You know what I mean? Like yeah. you're you're a big guy. Like I know if someone yells at you, that's their fault. That's their problem. You yeah. know what I mean? I got you. The guy saw me from behind. Probably thought this asshole. I'm going to say something. As soon as he saw my face, he went. You know what? Never mind. I didn't. I, I was. <laughs> so I think I'm at an advantage that I don't look like. You know, I grew up in Ridgecrest. We're roughnecks from there. Well, sure. You know, like. Parents didn't care if we were drowning. Like it, <laughs> no, it, uh, well that was the that was the generation too. Right, we all rode bikes, and if it, we broke our arms, that was just what you did during the day. And so, yeah, man, it's um, I think I scare them, but I will be. This is the truth. The two hecklers that have bothered me the most were people that heckled my wife. 
Ah. One guy came up on stage in San Diego and grabbed the mic out of her hand and started talking shit about her. So I walked up on stage and I grabbed him by the back of his coat and I walked him out the door and I threw him yeah, out the door. Yeah, you got to yard that dude out right now. Right. That, that no longer has to do with comedy. That's that's personal. That's family. You right. Just, you, you cross the line. There's no longer a comic in the audience. Now there's just some asshole right. messing with your chick and that right. he can't have. Since, well, you brought her up. Tell me a little bit about her. She's the best woman um, I've ever known, thank goodness. I, I prayed for her to God and he sent me exactly what I prayed for. I'm not joking on that one. Um, she is a sweetheart who, um, I don't even know if she knows she's pretty because like if you see her and then you look at my face, you're like, something's wrong with this lady's <laughs> eyesight. <laughs> Um, she, she's an actress as well and a comedian. We met in comedy. She took my classes and, um, yeah, we fell in love instantly. The minute wow. I met her, I, and I was going through a divorce and swore off women. I was like, no more. Sure. You know, I, I, if, if I can't find these five things, these qualities in a woman, I never, and she was and is and still is. And, but no, if people want to look her up, she's, um, if you like horror movies, she stars in about 20 um, like sci-fi channel type sure. horror movies yeah. or whatever. And she's the star. Like she'll kill the killer in those movies. What's her, her name? Her name's Rebecca Cochin. R-E-B-E-K-A-H. K-O-C-H-A-N. And she's great. And also, uh, yeah, she's been in a bunch of LGBTQ movies that made her famous. You got you to gotta question her judgment, though, if she picked you. Uh, you're not lying. <laughs> you're not lying, brother. You're not lying. You know, I looked up some of the stuff that you were doing, and you know, you, I don't know if you've ever Googled yourself or YouTubed yourself. Oh, no, I shouldn't. you do uh, Dante Comedy. Okay, what this, happens? This, well, this thing, come, there's like a bunch. There's like 75 things. Is that all right? So I look up Dante's Comedy, and, and, you, you, and it's... Um, it's it's very spiritual, and I'm looking at this, and I'm watching it, and I go, that's not funny at all. And I clicked over to the next one, and I said, okay, we'll watch this next one. It's Dante, and it's very religious, and it's it talks about the Bible, and I'm like, this isn't funny at all. And I went through 12 of them, and I'm like, and I'm scrolling around. They've got all these graphics of angels and demons and scripture, and I go... Where the fuck's Dante? I mean, I thought maybe you were narrating Dante Alighieri. It. Yeah. <laughs> right. The famous poet. And so it goes through right. all this stuff. I'm like, okay, I'm totally on the wrong page here, and I can't figure God. it out. <laughs> Here's the problem. I started in 1986. There was no internet. If I knew that we were going to be here, I would have <laughs> never just gone by Dante. No, I would have made up a, a last name yeah, or pick something. Pick up a unique right. name or something. But, right. So there you are, and you're like, well, now I'm stuck, and I'm competing. You're like, what are you doing here? Right. Because I'm telling you that the first 47 minutes. You don't videos- have to tell me. <laughs> That's why I always tell people Dante the comedian, because if you look up Dante comedy, you're going to be going down a rabbit hole of, of Italian craziness. I'll tell you, you know, you brought up, um, uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the program, uh, Last Man Standing. Uh, oh, Last the, Comic Standing. Uh, last yeah. Comic Standing. Last Comic Standing. Then there's judges. Yes. Who was the toughest judge that you, that you <laughs> were staring down when you did that? Mm, gosh. You know, did you feel like you were singled out by one judge? Or did- I, here's the truth. Yeah. I knew all three of them because my year, it was comedians who had been on the show before. And so I knew all of them, but I knew that they weren't, they knew everyone in line. They weren't going to give me favor over the 10 other people that they might even be better friends with. Okay. So that was actually more intimidating than going up against judges I didn't know. Oh, because they, they knew the routine. They knew what was to be expected. Right. Wow. But I will say this, that show I think has people they want to win and it's a game show. So they have to go by game game show rules but there are little glitches like I, I told everybody what happens is we that show that i won that happened in january our show wasn't going to start like they're editing now all this stuff and they're going to start running promos and yeah. then in Jan, uh, july the show is going to go live in july so um so what happens is the promos come out and it shows we we know that there's 10 people in the cast, right? Yeah. Right. It shows two of the comedians that are in the cast at the beginning of the commercial, about 20 other comics that aren't on the show, we know, because I know the cast. And then the same two guys from the beginning are at the end with two more jokes. I said to the other cast members, I said, we have to vote these two guys out because NBC wants them to win. So, there's yeah. 10 of us and they're showing them twice in a commercial. They're making them famous every single day you know, on you're NBC. You're making me feel a little bit like that, like that movie quiz show about 21. It happened just like that. Wow. But here's what would happen. You know when on Last Coming Standing, I don't know if you watched it, but 
they would have challenges. And so like, we'd have to go to the ice house and we get off the bus and everybody's like, Hey, welcome to the ice house. And then yeah. we go inside and there's a heckler challenge where I have to heckle Doug Benson and Amy Schumer has to heckle, you know, Lavelle Crawford or whatever it was at the right. time. That, yeah. those were, by the way, those are all cast members um, that year. It was a big year for comics. Season five, right? Season five. Yeah. yeah. So, um, but what happened was we pulled up to the ice house. Amy Schumer gets off the bus. There's a crowd outside. No one claps, nothing, just sort of hi. I get off the bus, nothing. Doug Benson off the bus, nothing. The two guys, it was uh, Lavelle Crawford and John Reap. When they got off the bus, people were screaming. Hey. Oh, come on. NBC had made them famous between January and July by putting them in That's every promo. That's almost like holding up the applause sign for everybody when you get off the bus. Okay, clap now. And guess who won? John Reap won, and in second place, it was Lavelle Crawford. That's a little okay. odd, isn't it? Yeah. Well, you know, it's one thing for reality TV, and I, I know, I know, I know, wrestling is staged, but it's very hard. It's very difficult. They, they rehearse and they practice, and it's dangerous. I know reality TV is scripted. They, I've learned from people that they, here's the situations we're all going to go for, and then a lot of it is improv within the confine of of the script. But with you guys, I would never want it to be that way because, for me. As a viewer, yeah. as an audience member, yeah. comedy is the last stronghold of being able to say what you want and do what you want, yep. and it's un it can be unrehearsed, <laughs> and it can be live. And I we should be able to pretty much do anything and say anything that isn't completely malicious or is going to hurt someone in the room. I no. don't mean I don't mean their feelings. I mean physically hurt them. Like, oh, sure. kill that man. Right, yeah. You know, something yeah. like that. And I, I don't... I, I am probably one of the strongest advocates for comics to be able there's no there's no boundaries for you guys in my opinion say what you want if it's funny say what you want you know it, it, there's a difference between making a joke about a crippled person in the front row and making fun of a crippled person in the front row you make fun of that person and right. you're tearing them down that's not funny right. and it's and it's dumb and you should, right. why are you doing that i'm against that Correct. but if you're talking about you know the whole it cripple people and, right. and you have a joke to tell the whole room's going to laugh and Correct. we're going to move on Correct. Or if I know that they're blind, I'd be like, man, if you could see, you would have loved what I just did physically. <laughs> Usually they'll laugh the hardest at right, it because I'm yeah. not punching down at them. I didn't say no, you're stupid because you're blind. That's the key. Punching down is right. a great way to talk. Yes, that's the, that's the terminology you got to avoid. I agree. Now, since we're on the topic and you've been doing this for so long, yeah. how, how much... Has it changed from when you were in the beginning to right now? And I mean, I'm you know, I'm speaking mainly about politically correct. Sure. So let's talk about that. So All right. political correctness is rough, and I was very afraid of it last year because I do and say whatever I want. I right. do. I'm I, I feel like I get away with a lot more than most people because I'm a Republican slash Democrat. I vote for whoever I think is best at the time. So and then I'm smart enough to know not to talk about it on stage because it's division. I also am smart it, enough not to talk about cancer because it bought, yeah. it'll take people out of my show right so you know the worst thing i'll say i'll start off and the only thing i'll say on politics would be like i didn't trust the last guy and this guy i don't trust to be alive in the morning boom everybody's right. happy everyone got a laugh right and we move on you know that's like, but you it's so uh you know you look at dave Chappelle, who right now is currently he pushes the envelope and dave's doing it on purpose Dave's going after the transgender community right. with jokes, with comedy. And he's like, and I, I believe he's pushing back on purpose going, I'm trying to hold back the damn I for know. everybody you're, else. You're not wrong. You're he's, not wrong. He's holding it there. Like, I'm doing it on purpose. He he may never even have gone down that road, except he feels like he's holding he that line. He has to, right. So I'll agree with you on that. So something changed my life this year. So I was, I was nervous. The past year, my wife, who is much younger than me, said, you can't tell that joke. You can't say that word. You can't do this anymore. Hey, see how that guy got in trouble? Look at that guy's career is over. So I nervously was going out to clubs and not doing what I wanted. And I didn't feel right. And then I went to Alaska and I was like, you know what? I've never been to Alaska. I'm going to do and say whatever I want here because if I never come back, it's Alaska. But it's risky. So I didn't care. So I went to Alaska and I was like, I'm going to do my shit. I'm going to do and say whatever I want. And I did, and I was getting sold out shows. I'd never even been to Alaska. Sold out every night, standing ovations. Like I all of a sudden went, everything I said, they laughed at. I made fun of everyone. I didn't punch down, but I also said everything that you would think you could get in trouble for. Yeah. And no one's coming up to me after the show. Yeah, but then your your plane ride home, you gotta be thinking, is this gonna play 
in LA? Is this going to play in Hollywood? And guess what? And then I did. And then I did it. Well, at how a, did you make that decision? Because you people are different in yes, different parts of the country. How because, did you make the decision to do it anyway? Because you realize if it doesn't hurt someone, if it's not malicious, even if you're talking shit about... I don't like, you know, uh, pronouns or this or that. If you say it to where even people who call themselves woke go, that's hilarious what he just said. You know what I mean? Like my daughter, who yeah. I would consider a nice young girl, she hates pronouns. And, you know, I, I and it's not like she doesn't believe that they can call themselves whatever they want. She's no, just like, do what you want. Do what you want. But just tell me your name. I'd rather call you John than they. Sure. Right. Whatever, you know what I mean? And so. Well, it's just you don't. You, the, I, not to become too political in our discussion, although we can. We can talk about whatever we want. I don't mind what people do. I don't care what you right. what you're into and what you call yourself. I might have a problem if you're trying to force me right. Thank to, you. to say it or to go along. Right. I, you know, I'm not imposing upon right. you. Please don't impose upon me. Correct. That's it. Hundred percent. Now when when you're in comedy, you know, I'm not I'm not trying to impose anything on you. I'm just trying to talk. I'm just having a conversation. I'm telling some jokes. If it's not funny, you're perfectly capable of telling me it's not funny. I'm okay with that, but don't, you know, you always hear comics, and I'm sure you have a hundred of these stories, but comics always get, they get harassed after the show. Right. Someone will walk, because how many comedy specials have you heard where someone says, well, I, I finished up the show in Austin, and a guy comes up to me, you know, because they find you after the show, and they're going to, they're going to, they're going to take issue with your performance. Those are the times, like, you got to say, it's just comedy, man. It's just a joke. Yeah. Yeah. Let me tell you something that also helped change my mind about everything. On the flight to Alaska, I watched Matt Reif. Do you know who he is? I do. Absolutely. Number one comic in America right now. Highest paid comic in America, in the world, in the world, the highest paid comic. Probably best looking comic there's ever been. And he just got his right, money. Some, right. He's some young kid yeah. that looks like a model. I had never really watched him. And uh, uh, no offense, Matt, if we've met a hundred times, I didn't remember <laughs> you. <laughs> But I watched his special and I was really impressed because he is much younger than me. He does play to millennials and whatever the more woke crowd is. He does, yeah. And his jokes are a thousand times more offensive than most things I say. And I'm pretty offensive. He, Yeah, and Matt has a way. Well, uh, I wish I could remember what the scandal he was just in. Um he, he, I forget, it escapes me right. It was a big story a couple months back. My son brought it to me and said, hey, Matt got in trouble for saying some stuff. So he goes out and he makes a public apology video. And in his apology video, he's got a link. And it basically is a link making fun of the people <laughs> that yeah, he yeah, went and did yeah. again. He's like, fuck you, because I <laughs> yeah. don't care. Right. And, and then the next series of stand-ups he did, I'm watching intently. He's like, yeah, I hope they don't take back the money. It's my first paycheck. I have my first $25 million. A month ago, I was working for you know three grand a month flying to every, grinding it out at every every place you've been to, all right. the places you've right. been to. I know he has. He goes, and now all of a sudden they're going to, you know, there's a threat of taking my money away because I'm just, I'm, it's just comedy, man. It's right. the same stuff I'm always doing. Right. I'm I'm glad that he's I'm, I I don't know I don't know if I'm in favor of how he pushed back as his agent I might sure. have said shut up <laughs> just hey but whatever it's doing he's doing it right and I think he's sort of killing that boundary because here's why you're right Th there are no let's talk about like let's go back to the Me Too movement sure. for example that didn't have boundaries people who were a bad date like Aziz Ansari were yep. getting the, in the same trouble as Harvey Weinstein yeah. which you shouldn't compare those two this guy's no. a rapist and this guy was a bad date but his whole career was ruined I mean Aziz had his TV show taken well, away Me Too was exactly what it said anybody right. include anybody Me sure. Too raise your hand you're in the club right. raise your hand right. we believe you Right. Raise your hand. Whatever your story is, it's true. We're believing you. And who's the bad guy? We're going to go well, get him. And, and what's the problem with that? There's no rules or law. So everyone was equally treated under the law the same, whether you were, right. a, you know, robbed a bank or whether you were just jaywalking. So, well, and that was anybody who was high profile. This, of course, happened everywhere because, you know, uh, the and, regular folks like you and me were all of a sudden scared to be doing anything in a grocery store because sure. a Me Too movement sure. could take you. But it, and that's and he, not to say that there weren't shitty men that deserved all the oh, shit they got, of course. Those fucking guys need to yep. be buried under the prison sure. as far as I'm concerned. Including Absolutely. Bill Cosby. Sure. He ruined people who wear sweaters for me. You thought you could trust them. <laughs> Can't trust a guy in a sweater anymore. Not always. A whole whole yeah. image gone. Um, but, you know, when people like Nancy Pelosi would come out and there was a high profile situation, a woman 
just would come out with her side of the story and automatically she would say, well, this woman needs to be believed. And I sat back in my chair and go, whoa, whoa, believed? Heard. heard. This woman should be heard. heard. This right. person should be listened. Yes, not, but. you Right. Not you everyone heard, tells the truth. No, you just heard a story. Right. Wow. Not everyone tells the truth. It However, I mostly believe when someone comes forward for any reason, but there are instances, but here's a good example. Ron Jeremy um, was going to trial because 27 women had accused him of something, right? Sure, right. But not one of them wanted a dime from him. That tells you it doesn't he it? probably did something really shitty. Right, yeah. That's, well, follow the money, that phrase right. that you if and someone, I have heard growing right, up our right. whole lives. It's, it's a very true statement. Right. It is. And would you? that's the other thing that bothers, it, my wife and I differ on this, and I'll tell you what she says. When someone uh, comes forward and says, well, 10 years ago this happened, and you, you, you listen to things like you just brought up, no money involved. Wanted to say something, get it on the record. I'm leaving now. I don't want any, I don't want to be on right. talk shows or going. My wife's first comment is, Well, why did you wait 10 years? I don't believe her. I'm like, mm, some of that stuff is so traumatic. You're lucky if if women ever want to say anything because it's so personal and it's so violating. And I'm I my first thought is not why'd you take so long? No, my my first inclination is Thank you for being brave enough to come forward. Now let's sort it out. Right. That's how I feel. Right. Give them a fair chance. I don't I don't knock them down for the time. Sure. At all. The time me either, because someone could have done something shitty, or even just putting a hand up your skirt, thinking you liked it and then you didn't. And when they finally get in trouble with twenty more women and you come out and say it, it's because, well, what were you gonna do? Go to the police? Did you have proof? Did you know what I mean? Did you want to sit in a, a court for a year and a half and watch them go to right. jail and you know and hope well, that they didn't like get out of jail and then come try to hurt then, you again? And and then there's there's a guy like you who's deep in the entertainment industry and you without naming names you know the power that's behind the other side if they want to squash you down for a woman that would come up you know you sure. know what's out there sure. to fight there are against probably horrible well, there's Weinstein Weinstein sure sure but i will say this as someone who's been in hollywood my whole life my whole life like yeah. i moved here at 21 and I now own an entertainment company and I've managed big stars and I still do and all this other stuff. I personally have only seen drugs about 10 times in all the times I've been here, by the way, offered or, and I'm talking anything harder than marijuana. Right. Um, 10 times, 10 times. And it was mostly- That's pretty low. Right. And that was mostly Sam Kennison going, <laughs> Dante, if you're not a cop, you will do this right now. Do it. Do um, it. Do it. Do it. Oh, oh. Um, <laughs> And that's true. That's true. Um, he would say it to me, if you're not a cop, you do this. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, only like 10 times. And then um, as far as like hearing about bad shitty men. The it's, casting it's, couch. It's, the so, casting so couch I've never heard of except on maybe from a few gay men that said the gay casting director hit on them. So yeah. that's just as bad. Whatever. I get it. You don't want to go to work and feel funny. Um, but I'm just saying like I haven't seen a lot of it. I have heard of a few comedians, comedians, let's say right. female comics who um, would say to me after a gig. Hey, so and so kept joking around. You know, hey, if you suck my dick, uh, yeah. I'll drive the rest of the way, or right. you know, things like that. And she goes, I just felt like you know, he did it probably ten times on the drive. Can you not book me with him again? Right. So instead, I called the guy and was just like, I'm not ever booking you again because you should have known better. You yeah. know what I mean? You just met Once this lady. It can be played off as a funny joke, but you keep right. after it. You're waiting for someone to change their mind. Right. Yeah. That's the only reason you're saying it over and over. Right. Right. Well, you know, there was, a, and there's, there's still, I believe, and this goes back to touches on a little bit of politically correct or incorrect. Um, there's a double standard on some of that stuff too, and I, and I have no idea what it is in the gay community. I wouldn't even pretend to know. But Joe Rogan one time made a made a joke, and uh, he talked about how Harvey Weinstein. You know, and if if if, if my daughter comes home to me right. and says, Harvey wants me to play, you know, this role, but I got to have sex with him. Joe says, well, I'm going to go down there and kick the shit out of Harvey. He says, and I got to be fair with you. I have a different opinion about my son. <laughs> if my son comes home and says, um, I get to be the lead. I get to play Batman in the new Batman movie. But the woman I have to sleep with looks like Mrs. Harvey Weinstein. Joe says, 
I'm looking at my son going, dude, you're going to be Batman. You know? <laughs> right. he goes, there, and there is a little bit of a double there standard is. on that stuff. Just It it does exist. It, right it, or wrong, it does right. exist. It does, it's, it, it, everything exists in every business. I'm sure, you know, at Hooters, that women are like, hey, if you do this, you give you more shifts. Absolutely. If you rub my back during this. Absolutely. You know, like people are just, it, there's good and bad in every group. But what I was trying to convey is sometimes, especially in this, everybody's, you know, trying to figure out how, what's real and what's not. I can tell you that at least in Hollywood, I've never heard of someone eating a baby. Like, what would that even do? (laughs) You know what I mean? Like, if you believe in science, you'd know that it's you're just eating flesh and it's not going to cure you or make you a vampire. Well, I'm glad that you know you could have 37 years in this. You could have definitely had some horror stories around you. No, you you definitely shitty people. But I've never heard of like you know like sure. Ron Jeremy is probably a monster, and I knew the man for a long time. I managed him for a yeah. while. Um, but, you know, I never knew that side of him. If I did, I'd, I would have walked away. I would have punched well, him see, if I ever that, saw it. That is such a uh, – boy, I'll tell you, since you, you brought up a great, a great topic. Yeah. I can't even tell you how many articles I've read or interviews I've seen where people will say those exact words. I didn't know that side of the person. You, you I can't even tell you the day he gave me a call and said, have you heard – the, have you read the news at six in the morning? I knew yeah. it was bad because it's six in the morning. I hung up on the man and I just searched his name and it said, Jackie Lacey, the DA of Los Angeles is arresting Ron Jeremy at three o'clock unless he turns himself in before that. And so I call him back and I said, what did you do? Well, women are accusing me of this and that. And I said, I'll tell you what, I don't know if you did or didn't do it. I hope you didn't do it, but if you did, I hope they put you away and that you rot in jail. And I'm going to have to put out a press release today saying basically that. Distance. Right. And you know what he said to me? He goes, Dante, that is fair. That's very fair. He goes, could you give me my lawyer's phone number? And that was the last time we ever talked. Wow. Yeah. But I'll tell you what, since that day, even you talking about it now makes me uncomfortable because you... He's not just a story. He's someone you knew. Right. He's someone I knew. And a lot of the, most 90% probably was before I ever even met them and was working with them. Let's sure. say. I met him a long time ago. Um, but, but he, uh, you know, you just, you just go, God, I, I, that's not the side I knew. The side I knew was like an old, you know, uncle or something, you yeah. know, he's, he falls asleep. Uh, he can barely walk, you know, he had dementia, you know, towards the end, um, you know, so I wasn't seeing you know, but I did see, I'll, here's what I'll, I'd say. What I was seeing him get in trouble for, and I had to keep saying, you have to stop. Times have changed. Young girls didn't know Ron Jeremy anymore. You know, when I yeah. was in high school, even teenage girls knew who Ron Jeremy sure. was. So for 40, let's say 38 years of his life, as a famous person, he would, people, hey, hey, can we get a picture? It's a man and a woman. He's grabbing the guy by his ass and the woman by the tits, and they're taking a picture, and everyone laughs and goes, hey, will you take her boobs out and sign them? And they does it, right. and then they walk away. Today, someone might go, I think that guy's famous. People are taking pictures. Let's get a picture. Now, 20-year-old girls are walking up, and he's grabbing boobs. They think he's yeah. just a, yeah. an actor. Right. They don't know who he is. And even if he is some porn star, why did you touch me? Yeah. And so I completely got it. Or he'd stick his hand up their skirt or something. And I said, hey, man, whatever you were doing for 40 years, Stop. you may no longer do it because yeah. you're going to go, you're going to get in trouble. And I think that a lot of what, and I'm not saying a lot of the stuff that was newer, I think was that. And then a lot of stuff that was older. I didn't even, I, I haven't even read an article about it because none of it makes me happy. Yeah. But you know, you, 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 you talk about that and I know I kind of interjected there, but I, you, you, you seem like your face kind of sank a little bit because you knew the guy it wasn't right it wasn't a story that was around my family that we're both talking about of somebody you and i both read yesterday in the sunday paper this is somebody you knew right there's a there's a whole different aspect when you got to tell someone that on a personal level right and it's not like he and i he would come over every day almost for like a half hour or an hour because he he had a flip phone and he couldn't film his own cameos. <laughs> so as his manager, I was like, you know, I, you can't do this. He's like, I'll give you half. I was like, fine, I'll do it every day. Because he was making like 200 a pop and he was doing maybe two a day. I was like, I can make $200 a day. <laughs> so he would come over for like a half hour and I'd see him and we'd film and I'd give him some cheese and crackers and he'd go out or whatever. That was it. So it's not like we were hanging out at night. We did some stand-up together here and there, but you, 
he's one more client. I have at the time I had two hundred and fifty. Well, I'm you know what? Speaking of um, of of doing things for money and what you do, you getting some cash for. I'm thankful that you have reached the heights of your career where I just had to offer you a sandwich and you decided to <laughs> yeah, drive out of here. Yeah, yeah. You know, you're like, oh, look, I got a bunch of money. Don't offer me money, but if you got a, if you got a good sandwich, if I'll show up. There's a sandwich in it. I'm here. That's when I was saying, yes. like, this is the guy we want. He's got enough money. He doesn't need money, but you got a good ham sandwich now. Ham on rice sandwich. Now you're in. Now, if you're if you're not watching the video, <laughs> I am having the most beautiful lobster and. <laughs> rye and ham on rye sandwich. It's gorgeous. Uh, tell me the worst place you ever played. The 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 because you, it's always it's always legendary. Hmm. But it's it's mostly we don't get to know this kind of stuff. We always hear the comedy circuit is tough. It's dingy. It's grimy. Some of those places you guys have to tour in city after city. After what's the worst one you ever played? God, you know what? I'll probably just m say one because it's closed. Um. But it's probably true. There were these clubs called the Looney Bins. Um, mm -hmm. They were in Tulsa, um, Wichita, I don't know, uh, Oklahoma City. They were, one was in one, all right. So the way it works is when you go out on the road as a comic, they either put you up in a hotel and get a driver to, you know, just a, an employee even. Sure. You know, it's not like a limo. Someone picks you up and they take you to the club or you in take, a, in a, or they in pay a Camry. you back. <laughs> right, in a Camry. Um, or they put you up in a comedy condo, mm. which they own a house or a condominium and then all the comics stay there or an apartment or something. Wow. And the comics move in every week and move out and then they have a cleaning person come in and out. So, sure. um, so at this place though, the one I think in... Wichita was inside an old garage from a hundred years ago. But what basically they did was they built half of it as a comedy club. And then the other half they made our apartment. So it was the weirdest thing. They would shut this industrial building down at night and we were kind of stuck in it. I mean, we could go in and out, but there's an alarms and we had to like lock it right. It was, it was insane to play there. And then you, even the crowds weren't that great. You know, it was like 25 people at the shows and you're like, none of this is worth it. Do you play better when you go last if the if the if everyone's been drinking a little bit, or is it is it tougher to go on first? Yeah, going first sucks. That's why it's uh, it, it, people think it's easy to be the host or the MC because you just got to go out there and be funny a little bit up front five minutes and then you just bring up people and say their name. Right, it's not true. You have to be the one that gets the attention because people are still talking, they're still ordering, they're still thinking they can be loud and you can't hear them. And they're not you're drunk loud. yet; they're not ready to right. receive all that. Correct. So you want to be last, but I will say this: the last time I played Bakersfield, and I can't wait to play the Well. By the way, have you been there yet? I have not. The Well is the new comedy club. I I just Googled it as I, I was arriving to your house and it said in three miles, you could arrive at the well. So I'll go visit it afterwards. I want to play there. But um, the last time I played here, some guy had a club. I don't know, just a, a club, right? And he was doing it wrong. He wanted to do three comics up front and then do a break and then do another three comics on the end. Well, his crowd, he decided we're going to start late so people can drink more. They were too drunk for the first three. <laughs> By the middle part, they went to go drink more. By the last three, all they were doing was sort of yelling at us, and you know what I mean. Like, well, you, yeah, you got you got to know the room. The guy, the guy who owns the place, has to know his audience. And I was screaming, "Please don't do this, please!" <laughs> well, how are they going to know to drink? I'm like, "There's a bar right there." <laughs> How do they know normally? Yeah, how do people? Do you have to tell people that's your audience? You got to tell them when to drink. God, Great, it was bad. It was. I'm bad. in the wrong room. Yeah. Good God. Yeah, you guys, the comics. I don't think. Um, I really don't think you guys get enough credit for how hard it is to achieve in in comedy. I don't. I don't think you get enough credit for how how many years you spend on the road. Um, honing your craft until you get that big break. That's yeah. hard. And and look, a big break doesn't mean you're rich. I'm not rich. I, I wish I were, you know. Um, but a big break sometimes means you don't have to try as hard to get each gig. You sure. know, before I was on Last Comic or other shows, when I call around, they're like, I don't know, send me your stuff. And why are they going to pick me over anyone else, right. you know? But now, thank God, I have some name recognition. And now with the internet, you can build up your socials and things like that. You get a like better that. slot. You get a better right. slot, for sure. But here's a great thing that my mom said to me, but I sort of figured out myself. She said, don't you feel ashamed that you're a grown man and your younger cousin has worked for the military his whole life and he now has a house on the beach? And I and and you don't have a house and you know this stuff right. like this and and I said, Mom, 
I've traveled the world telling dick jokes. I got paid to travel the world. <laughs> I've been to Japan and Korea 20 times each. You know what I mean? I've been all over the entire planet multiple times. And I said, and for the past 37 years, I didn't have to grow under fluorescent lights or have someone yell at me. I said, I would, I would do it over again. Well, and if you sat your mom down when you were five years old and you said your mom, someone told your mom, which is harder? Have a, have a 30 years in the military or make a living telling dick jokes for 30 there's, years. There's, there's no, there's no contest there. You know, which one's harder. Right. That's impossible. Right. To do. It's impossible to uh. do because you also have to change with the times. You know, someone asked me on an interview the other day, what's your favorite quote that you tell people? And it's not my favorite, but it's one of my favorites for comics. I guess we were on a comedy one. Yeah. And it's the best trait of any artist is survival. That's my quote. Best trait of any artist is survival. Think Boy, about that, someone like Elton yeah. John. He's still relevant today. Yeah. If he showed up at a concert, everyone would go buy his tickets today. Um, there's lots of people that you wouldn't. They're going to play maybe a small venue with 80 other famous people from the 50s. Well, it's such a competitive thing in, in music and TV and movies and everything. I mean, let's get into, you know, one of the things you, you own, your company is Golden Artist Entertainment. Yeah. So you manage other artists. You got yeah. some you got some veterans that have been in, in, in comedy and TV and stage in the 70s and 80s. You also have up and coming people that are trying to cut their teeth right now. So you, you cover quite a bit. Yes. But it's, it's how hard is it to stay relevant? Because that's a tough one. I mean, what are the, what are some of the most popular videos you see on YouTube? Hey, child stars, where are they now? Here they had a, a hit show, and now they could never find work again. And and to be fair, some of your guys have spread out. They do producing, they do writing, they or they quit the business altogether. Sure, maybe how, they didn't like it. How tough is that to manage someone who's trying to stay relevant or would like to still sure. be in the industry? Well, it's something that you have to navigate with certain people because some people are, are really good about it. Like um, Haywood Nelson, who's m probably going to join you at some point We're for an interview. So, yeah. um, he played Dwayne on What's Happening. And he's one of my clients. And he's great about like, you know, he was like, man, I loved the business, but then I kind of wanted to go do something else. And I got into lighting and that was exciting for me. But he goes, now at my age, I'm thinking of coming back. And so that's why I took him on. I was like, cool. There's, there's conventions at least that I can get you into where- yeah. Yeah, people sure. want to meet you and sign stuff and things like well, that. Well, that was that. You know that we were talking about ha doing the radio station that we're picking up doing, doing um, having some interviews. I've just started with the most regular people that that, that are the that are salt of the earth in what they're doing. You know, and that's you with comedy. And I had a guy who was in the Marine Corps. You know, just the, the regular salt of the earth people that can relate. You're gonna love Haywood then. And we, it was kind of funny. We sit down in a staff meeting with Gen X Talks, and I'm my my whole premise is like, well. At the car show, kind of, okay. you know, Two Bears got a Route 66 car show in Fontana, and it's growing every year, and we've been part of the last three. And I said, well, you know, we should get a celebrity. We should try to get, first, if you can get a car guy out there, you know, if you get David Hasselhoff in the kit car, now that fits a car show. But if you can't find, you know, you can't get the Dukes of Hazard out there with the General Lee, I said, why don't we get somebody that our age would recognize? And it's kind of funny. You say, well, there's got to be some actors out there that that are, are, are so far removed, you could probably get them for 50 bucks in a sandwich. And I'm like, well, then if they're not charging anything, do we really want them? Right. You want a guy like, like he would, who's like, well, give me a few bucks for doing what I do. He has a name. People like him. And, and they'll I, be so happy to see him. I'm going to go out. If we work this out where we, uh, today I was going to finish yeah. talking to you about that. I want to go out and just have one of those vinyl canvas pictures made of him from that time. Right. Why not? With a picture of what's happening. And that way and people can get a picture. Because like, oh, that guy, that's all they want is a, oh, where is he now? Lean, 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 <laughs> lean, 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 lean. I hey, hey, hey. Fred, Fred Berry passed away, didn't he? He was, he was, he was my best friend, yeah. He, uh, he used to open for me. I, so the night I won the, the BET Awards was the night I met him. Yeah. Richard Pryor was in the front row. I talked to him as I was winning. I was like, it's just, and then I look over and there's Rerun. And that was one of my favorite shows growing up. <laughs> and I said, uh, as I went back to my seat, I said to my ex-wife, I said, I got to go meet him after the thing. And so sure enough, I, I go and he goes, oh, yeah, I'm a big fan of yours. Because at the time, I was on BET literally every day 
for 10 years doing stand-up. There was a show called Comic View and I had done it so many different times that it would run four times a day and each time was a different one. And so they would show me maybe at this block in the morning and then at this block the next day and this block. So I was on every single day. So almost every black person in the 90s. They knew you. <laughs> they knew me. So he went crazy for me. And and he's, I said, do you want to go feeling, on the road? Right. And I said, you want to go on the road with me? He's like, I don't know. I just sort of dance and I have a couple jokes. I'm like, let's do it. People are going to buy extra tickets because you're there. Absolutely. So he, he did... Sadly, I started running a show when my, my daughter was born at a bowling alley near my house. And he liked emceeing there because he, he had had a stroke. And it was just more fun for him just come out for 20, 30 bucks or something a night. Just tell a couple jokes and go home. Um, but one night I said goodnight to him. And I said, you have a gig, a real gig tomorrow out of town. You know, blah, blah, blah. Don't forget, call me tomorrow. I get a call the next day from his roommate saying he'd passed away. No. So, yep. That was that. That <sighs> was that. But you know what's interesting? My therapist, I, 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 my, when my parents died, um, my, I had to get a therapist, my wife said, so I, just for depression. And so, and my sister died, my, everybody died. Everyone died. Everyone in my family, except my other sister. Um, but my therapist said to me, when you grew up, why are, why are you, because, because like, <sighs> I've always been concerned with right and wrong. Like, for me, if you're a bad person, I don't need to get to know you. You know what right. I mean? Yeah. Like, right and wrong. Like, I, you could be, uh, I don't care if you're on the wrong team. As long as you're the nice person, I'm never going to be mad at you or whatever. Um, she goes, why do you care so much about right and wrong? And I said, I don't know. And she goes, well, tell me about your childhood. Who raised you? And I said, TV raised me. My parents were out partying every night, you know, because they were running the celebrities into the base every yeah. week or whatever. And I said, I guess, you know, good times and happy days and what's happening. And you know, Laverne and Shirley, they all raised me. And she goes, and um, what? where would you say you are with, with those shows? And I said, well, Rerun was my best friend. Dwayne's one of my clients. Jimmy Walker's one of my clients. She goes, oh, I see you found your parents. I was wow. like, wow. <laughs> so that's why I pay you for therapy. <laughs> Bam. Thank you, lady. Bam. It's nice when you can feel like that check you're writing counts for something. Yes. Doesn't it? Like, okay, yes. Yeah. Good. And you can write one more. And I, Thank you. I don't need you anymore. Thank you for doing that for me. <laughs> that's a, uh, you, you're, you're, well, you latchkey generation. We yeah. both were, and that's part of just growing up Generation X. Man, you want to see my arm from having to grow up with parents that weren't watching me? <laughs> I broke my arm one day. My parents were out. I had to wait for them to come back. And then my mom came back and said, well, I just got a ride home. You have to wait till your dad's off the golf course. <laughs> now my arm looks like this. Holy can you see shit. this terrible thing? I have a whole new thing I can make fun of you now. I had no yes. idea that was Man, a deal. Now we, I can. Ridgecrest was not. And then... You only have to get D's to be a doctor in Ridgecrest. Well, they didn't. I don't think Ridgecrest had a hospital. Did they? <laughs> <laughs> Unless I was born under a rock, they did. But the poor guy apparently wasn't great. <laughs> oh, man, how's that? Does that? How could you? In a room full of people, how could you say? Does that look okay to everybody else? Right. All right, good. We're done. <laughs> like no one even notices this until I point it out. I'm like, have you seen my stupid arm? <laughs> You yeah. know, it's not like they didn't have another arm of yours to compare it to. They could have said, wait, 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 th these two don't look the same. Something's wrong here. Well, he tried, man. But like I said, to be a doctor, you just got to get a D minus. And those doctors end up in Ridgecrest. So tell me about your company, the Golden Arts. Who do you, who, you know, tell me about how that is right now. Do you... Are you booking people? Are you getting them into TV? Are you getting them sure. into movies? Is this so I, ha I, I, I have clients that are on TV shows like The Trader right now. So reality stars, you know, there's a, I have big reality stars um, on our roster. So if you guys are fans of them, we have a bunch coming out this season on some new TV shows. Um, we have, you know, we do really good with sponsorship deals for a lot of our bigger celebrities. Right. Um, we have some big deals going on right now for a couple of people getting their own reality shows show um how are you doing about now you you're are, i'm assuming you're managing yourself so how are you what do you got coming up what's on the horizon for you so all right good thanks i'll promote a few things there if you that's go. all right <laughs> so i am teaching at the um oh god what is it called I'm teaching because uh, I don't want to mess it up. It has a very specific. No, get it right. You only get it's, one it, shot it, at this. It's, it's comedy fantasy camp. And I'm one of about, I don't know how many teachers, maybe 10, but listen to the other teachers. I'm teaching at comedy fantasy camp. Look it up right now. All right. Um, with Jay Leno, John Lovitz, Caroline Ray, um, Adam Carolla, um, I, I don't know who else. I could keep what going. A, what an all-star way to learn how to right. do something. Wow. Right. Wow. That's wow. impressive. Yeah. 
Yeah, man. And I couldn't believe that I was able to teach with them. So if you guys, it's at the end of this month. I think it's like the 29th through March 3rd or something. Well, you're doing something. You're doing three days around Valentine's Day stand-up somewhere, aren't you? So let me tell you about stand-up. This weekend, I'll be in Seattle, the 9th and 10th of February. Um, February 15th through the 18th, my wife and I are in Reno at the Laugh Factory at the Silver Legacy. On the 24th of this month, I will be at the Merck in Temecula. And then I think it's the 9th and 10th of April... The next month, I think I'm at Pachanga Casino in um, Temecula as well. Oh, so. you're you're busy, busy. I yes. mean, you're not. It's not like you're slowing down. No, no. I wow. I work all the time. But here's what I tell my my clients: I can work from anywhere in the world, and the hour that I'm on stage is not taking away from your career. No, not at all. You no. know, and leading up to it, literally, I was in. Um, Alameda, California, two weeks ago performing. And as I'm walking to the stage, I'm dealing with some other comedy club that isn't paying my comic and just screaming in the phone and the, in the green room. And I hear my name. I'm like, all right, I gotta go. And I <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I fight for people even as I'm running to the stage. Well, I don't, I don't doubt your tenacity and experience. I mean, you've done so much for so long. That almost has to be second nature when these up and coming kids are managers running places and they're, you know, they're trying to be a little, little shady on stuff. You've seen it all before. You had to have going across the country. You had to have seen it. Everybody all. can be shady. I, that's one thing too that bothers me because I'm not. When people send me a contract, we will spend hours and so much money with lawyers going, "No, cut this out," putting everything in red and going, "This has." And, and when I send a contract out, let's say you and I agree, uh, you're going to come to LA next week, and I'm going to give you five grand to say a couple lines in a movie. Right. I'm going to give you a contract that's going to say just that. Not, and if you don't, then you owe me five thousand. And if this happens, I own yeah. your thing through perpetuity and well, and your name and like you know. You we we you that and never I, happens with I, no one ever says. By the way, my lawyer needs to talk to you about the contract. Right. Because it says whatever we agreed to. Because that we were raised differently. It's just right. it's a different era. It's a different generation. I'm telling you, there's nobody believes in a handshake anymore. Nope. Nobody says, well, this is what we agreed upon. Let's shake hands on it and then write it down. Because what you write down is going to be what we said. Correct. They don't, they don't do that. Do you want to hear something interesting yeah. about a contract? Go ahead. So me and the ShamWow guy, do you know who that is? ShamWow, yes. Slap Chop, all that stuff. Yep. I met him in like 1992 before he was famous, and he wanted me to write for a movie of his. And I did, and it came out. I think it was called the uh, Underground Comedy Movie. And Michael Clark Duncan was in it. Slash was in it. I was A bunch of people were in it. And then uh, later... Um, all of a sudden, I saw him on TV as the ShamWow guy. And he calls me up out of the blue. I hadn't seen him in 10 years. He goes, hey, Dante, I'm the ShamWow guy now. And, you know, blah, blah, blah. Eminem, the rapper, wants me to do this. And so I, I became his writer again. And we made a commercial for Eminem. And then, then he wanted to do the slap chop thing. And then another ShamWow thing. And I became his writer. And I wow. direct some of it. And this went on for years and years and years. We worked together forever, 20-something years. Never had a contract. Not one day did he would. It, sometimes I didn't even know. I was going to Canada one time. I hadn't even asked how much I'm being paid. And it was for a <laughs> month. But I knew he was going to buy me every meal. Right. That I'd be in a hotel that he yeah. paid. You know what I mean? He's flying. He's, you knew that part was without question. I never once at the end of something went, he didn't pay me enough. Oh my God, why did I? I should have. But I will say this. Then I became his manager. And I, I was trying to get him a deal in Australia. And the night before, these guys said, I need you to let him know at the meeting that he's going to need a contract for himself and a separate one for you as the creator slash producer. And I was like, I, we've never had a contract. I don't know if he's going to be happy with this. Wow, and sure enough, it ended our friendship because wow. I had asked for a contract. He's like, but we do everything on a, I was like, I know, but, but these, it wasn't you. It wasn't me. Oh, wow. yeah, well. He's not a bad person. I'm not saying that for any no, reason. No, no, it's I'm just saying, one of those things. It's just it's, one of those things. In right. the business, is, in the industry, there's, sure. there's forces that come to bear. Sure. And they. And friendships end too. Yeah. This shit just happens. Well, I tell you what, I would very much like to, first of all, I'd love to have you back. We didn't scratch the surface on <laughs> this stuff. We got our hour in, but you know, sometime in the future, when you got time again, in between <laughs> your hustle and bustle, you got to come back again. I would again. love to. And I'd really like to get some of your clients I'm to I'm going to tell them to come because I had a great time. Oh, I'm so glad to hear that. I was, I, you know, we're still, we're still relatively new at interviews and sometimes it, it, it all depends on who I'm sitting across. On, on whether it goes well or not. Right. Um, I haven't had any have I haven't had an interview tank, but I just have gone and something like that didn't go as well as I wanted it to. 
talking with you, Dante, was as easy as breathing. Oh, thanks. It Same was to you. Natural as just having Same a to conversation. You. We were just talking. Yeah, just having just, a beer, and somebody turned on a camera. You right. know. Yeah. We were getting to know each other. Well, I hope very much that you can come back. And thank you for taking time to get in here with us. You bet. Um, and like oh, I said. One, can I say one more thing? Absolutely. I forgot. I have a new comedy album now, <laughs> you guys. I should have said that first. So here's where you're going to hate me. All Guess right. what it's called. All right. Dante Alighieri wrote Dante's Divine Comedy. Yeah. That was the famous book that, that when I'm you, getting confused right, with. Yeah. Guess what I decided to call my album this don't, year? Don't. Dante's Divine Comedy Album. Why? Do you want to know why? My we, hope was <laughs> college students would download this accidentally yeah. and make me rich. Well, That's I'm the main reason. I'm going to tell you right now, there is so much confusion on YouTube going the other way. I think you need to cash in some in your direction because yes. they're sucking all the air out of the yes. room with your name. I know. They really I know. are. So. Go to, also, you can get Dante Does Dallas. I recorded it in Dallas about 15 years ago, and that one's crazy dirty, and there's good stories and celebrity it stories. It sounds a lot like that movie Debbie Does <laughs> Dallas from the 70s. Yeah. That's the first thing that pops yeah. into my mind. Well, that's like, why I did it. I didn't know you it's were in the It's even me on like a leather couch. I'm and, not judging you no, at all. Not me. <laughs> well, thank you for yeah, coming man. here, man. I really appreciate it. Well, Thanks for me, having me. Let me close this out here. Thank you, guys. Now, did you see what the interview was? I told you it was going to be different than the podcast. I warned you that we had somebody special. Special, and I did not lie. I did deliver. I think uh, you guys are looking forward to part two. We got to do that sometime. But when Dante's around, leave this up there. We'll put all the stuff in the, in the description for all the links to his album, where he's going to be, what he's going to do. I'm sure he's got a website with a schedule. We'll link you to that one. So no matter how old this video gets, there'll always be a current link to what he's doing. Thank you guys for tuning in around the planet. Not sure where you tuned in from, AM, FM, Sirius, XM, or perhaps some of you are still listening on the Armed Service Radio Network. Cool. Remember two things wherever you go. Oh, there you are. I'll catch you guys on the flip side.